السلام عليكم اليوم محاضرتنا حتكون عن الأوربت راح نناقش بها the most important subject in the orbit we'll talk about preceptal cellulitis orbital cellulitis orbital floor fracture and lastly thyroid eye disease before discussing our subject I want you to, to see this image of the orbital cavity which is conical in shape or funnel shape uh, composed of many bones uh, we have the frontal bone maxillary zygomatic lacrimal ethmoidal and palatine bone all these bones contribute the formation of the orbital cavity the orbital cavity have a floor roof lateral medial wall and we have the orbital apex which we have there the optic foramen through which the optic nerve pass in the floor we have the infraorbital groove through which the infraorbital nerve pass I want you to see this image uh, I want you to notice an important structure here which is called the orbital septum the orbital septum it is in a fibrous tissue it is a continuation of the bone periosteum a continuation of the periosteum or the orbital rim this structure separates the superficial subcutaneous tissue from the deep orbital tissue we'll start talking about preceptal cellulitis preceptal cellulitis is an infection of the subcutaneous tissue anterior to the orbital septum notice this infection of the subcutaneous tissue anterior to the orbital septum although not strictly an orbital disease it is included here because it must be differentiated from the much less common but potentially more serious orbital cellulitis occasionally rapid progression to orbital cellulitis may occur the most important causes of preceptal cellulitis a skin trauma like laceration or insect bite the offending organ organisms is usually staph aureus or streptobiogen b separated from local infections such as an acute cardiolum, dacryocystitis, or sinusitis. C. From a remote infection of the upper respiratory tract or the Middle East by hematogenous separate. The signs of preceptal cellulitis, as you saw in the first image, there is a unilateral, tender, and red lid with periorbital edema. In contrast to orbital cellulitis, proptosis and chemosis are absent. Visual acuity, pupillary reaction, and ocular motility are in, in, um, impaired. There is no systemic manifestation. CT scan of those patients will show opacification of the soft tissue anterior to the orbital septum, while the soft tissue of the orbital cavity or the deep tissue are intact. Treatment is usually with oral coamoxiclav every eight hours severe infection may require intravenous antibiotic we'll talk now about bacterial cellulitis which is a life-threatening infection of the soft tissue behind the orbital septum it may occur at any age but is more common in children the most common causative organism are strep pneumonia staph aureus strep biogen and h influenzae The causes of orbital cellulitis. 1. Sinus related. The most commonly ethmoidal sinusitis typically affect children and young adults. 2. Extension of preceptal cellulitis through the orbital septum. 3. Local separate from adjacent dacryocystitis. Midfacial or dental infection. The last condition may cause orbital cellulitis via the intermedullary maxillary sinusitis. 4 hematogenous separate 5 post-traumatic 
develops within 72 hours of an injury that penetrates the orbital septum. The typical clinical features may be masked by associated laceration or hematoma. 6. Post-surgical that may follow or complicate retinal, lacrimal, and orbital surgery. Diagnosis of patients with orbital cellulitis depends on the sign and symptom. Usually those patients presented with a rapid onset of severe malaise, fever, pain, and visual impairment. The size in signs including unilateral, tender, warm, and red periorbital and lid edema. Proptosis often obscured by lid swelling. It is most frequently lateral and downward. Patient may develop painful ophthalmoplegia. Also optic nerve dysfunction. The CT scan of patient with orbital cellulitis differ from that of patient with a preceptor cellulitis. Here, we see the opacification involving the tissue of the orbital cavity, the deep tissue of the orbital cavity, not only the superficial tissue. As I said, that orbital cellulitis it is a life-threatening condition. We may have a complication, including ocular complication, intracranial complication, or subperiosteal abscesses. Ocular complication include exposure keratopathy, raised intraocular pressure, occlusion of the central retinal artery or vein, endophthalmitis, and optic neuropathy. The intracranial complications, which are rare but extremely serious, include meningitis, brain abscess, and cavernous sinus thrombosis. The last is an extremely serious complication, which should be suspected when there is an evidence of bilateral involvement, rapidly progressive proptosis, and congestion of facial, conjunctival, and retinal veins. Additional features include abrupt progression of all clinical signs associated with the prostration, severe headache, nausea, and vomiting. The subperiosteal abscess is most frequently located along the medial orbital wall. The treatment involves these points. First, hospital admission with otolaryngological assessment and frequent ophthalmic review is mandatory. Two, antibiotic therapy involves intravenous ceftazidine with oral metronidazole to cover anaerobes, vancomycin is useful as an alternative in the context of penicillin allergy. Antibiotic therapy should be continued until the patient has been apyrexial for four days. Three, monitoring the optic nerve function every four, four hours by testing pupillary reaction, visual acuity, color vision, and light brightness appreciation. Four, investigation, including the following, Y cell count, blood culture, CT scan of the orbital sinuses and brain, orbital CT, particularly useful to exclude superiosteal abscess, lumbar puncture if meningeal or cerebral sinus develop. 5. Surgical intervention in which the infected sinuses and orbital collection are drained should be considered in the following circumstances. When there is lack of response to antibiotic, when there is subperiosteal or intracranial abscess, when there is a typical picture which may merit biopsy. The other subject in the orbit is the orbital blowout fracture. The blowout fracture of the orbital floor is typically caused by a sudden increase in the orbital pressure by an impact object which is a greater, greater in diameter than the orbital aperture, about 5 cm, such as a fist or a tennis ball, sometimes called a tennis ball injury, so that the eyeball itself is displaced and it transmits rather than absorb the impact. Since the bone of the lateral wall and the roof are usually able to withstand such a trauma, the fracture most frequently involves the floor of the orbit along the thin bone covering the infraorbital canal. Occasionally, the medial wall may also be fractured. You have a pure and impure blowout fracture. The pure blowout fracture does not involve the orbital rim, whereas an impure fracture involves the rim 
and or adjacent facial bones. Clinical features vary with the severity of trauma and the time interval between injury and examination. Diagnosis depends on symptoms and size of the patients. On examination, as you see in this photo, there is a periocular size including variable ecchymosis, edema, occasionally subcutaneous emphysema, infraorbital nerve anesthesia involving the lower lid, cheek, side of the nose, upper lip, upper teeth, and gum is very common because of the fracture frequently involves the infraorbital canal. Patients may develop diplopia because of the involvement of extraocular muscle, either by hemorrhage and edema to the muscle or by mechanical entrapment of the muscle within the fracture line or sometimes direct injury to the muscle. Also, the patient may have anophthalmos due to the recession of the globe into the orbital cavity at the fracture site or ocular damage due to the direct injury. CT scan with coronal sections is particularly useful in evaluating the extent of fracture. Sometimes you use what is called HES test or HES chart, which is useful in assessing and monitoring the progression of diplopia. Management of patient with orbital floor fracture may have initial management and subsequent management. The initial treatment is conservative with antibiotic, ice packs, and nasal decongestant may be helpful. The patient should be instructed not to blow the nose. This point is very important. Why? Because, if the, because of the possibility of forcing infected sinus content into the orbit. Systemic steroids are occasionally required for severe orbital edema, particularly if this is compromising the optic nerve. Subsequent treatment is aimed at prevention of permanent vertical diplopia and or cosmetically unacceptable in ophthalmos. There is a risk factor for developing thyroid eye disease or thyroid ophthalmopathy. The most important two risk factor is smoking and female gender. The greater the number of cigarettes smoked per day, the greater the risk, and giving up smoking seems to reduce the risk. Women are five times more likely to develop thyroid eye disease than men, but this is largely reflected the reflecting the increased incidence of Graves' disease in women. What is the pathogenesis of thyroid eye disease? One, there is an inflammation of extraocular muscle characterized by pyomorphic cellular infiltration with increased secretion of glycosaminoglycan and osmotic imbibition of water. There is increase in the muscle size to nearly eight times their normal size, leading to restriction of their movement and later by fibrosis of this muscle resulting in a restrictive myopathy and diplopia. Two, there is an inflammatory cellular infiltration with inflammatory cells, including lymphocytes, plasma cells, macrophages, and mast cells of the interstitial tissue, orbital fat, and lacrimal gland, with the accumulation of glycosaminoglycans and retention of water. This causes increase in the volume of the orbital content and secondary elevation of intraorbital pressure. We have five clinical manifestation of thyroid ophthalmopathy, A, soft tissue involvement, B, lead retraction, C, proptosis, D, optic neuropathy, E, restrictive myopathy. The thyroid ophthalmopathy passed through two stages in the development of the disease. First is the congestive or the inflammatory stage in which the eye are red and painful. This tends to remit within three years and only 10% of patients develop serious long-term ocular problems. The second stage, which is the fibrotic or quiescentic stage, in which the eyes are white, although painless motility defects may present. The first ocular symptom of thyroid ophthalmopathy is the soft tissue involvement. As you see in these photos, the patient, the redness and the soft tissue involved resulting in a red eye. Patient presented with the grittiness, photophobia, lacrimation, and retrobulbar discomfort. On examination, we'll see, as in these photos, epibulbar hyperemia, which is a sensitive sign of inflammatory activity. Intense focal hyperemia may outline the insertions of the horizontal recti, 
Periorbital swelling is caused by edema and infiltration behind the orbital septum. This may be associated with chemosis, which means conjunctival swelling and edema, and prolapse of retroceptal fat into the eyelids. How we treat those patients with soft tissue involvement? Usually we use lubricant for corneal exposure and dryness. We use topical anti-inflammatory drugs like steroids, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or cyclosporine. Head elevation with three pillows during sleep to reduce periorbital edema. Eye taping during sleep may alleviate mild exposure keratopathy. The second ocular manifestation is lead retraction, which occur in about 50% of patients with Graves' disease. As a result of the following postulated mechanisms, maybe there is a fibrotic contracture of the levator muscle associated with adhesion to the overlying orbital tissue, causing lead retraction. Or sometimes fibrosis of the inferior rectus muscle may similarly induce retraction of the lower lid. Or, there is a secondary overaction of the levator muscle and superior rectus complex in response to hypotropia produced by fibrosis and tethering of inferior rectus muscle. Lastly, the humorally induced overaction of molar muscle as a result of sympathetic overstimulation, secondary to high level of thyroid hormone. Any of these mechanisms together or isolated may result in the lid Retraction. How can we examine? How can we discover lid retraction? As you see in these photos, uh, normally the upper lid margin normally rests two millimeter below the superior limbus. Lid retraction is suspected when the margin is either leveled with or above the superior limbus, allowing the sclera to be visible. This is called scleral show. The lower lid normally rests at the inferior limbus. Retraction of the lower lid suspected when the sclera shows below the limbus. Lid retraction may occur in isolation or in association with the proptosis, which exaggerates its severity. Management Mild lid retraction does not require treatment because it frequently improves spontaneously. Control of hyperthyroidism may also be beneficial. Surgery to decrease the vertical dimension of the palpebral fissures may be considered in patients with significant but stable lid retraction. Proptosis. Proptosis is axial, may be unilateral or bilateral, could be symmetrical or asymmetrical, and frequently permanent. Severe proptosis may compromise lid closure, as you see in these photos when it compromises the, the, the eyelid closure with resultant exposure keratopathy, corneal dryness, corneal ulceration, and infection. Management is controversial. Some favor early surgical decompression, where others consider surgery only when the non-invasive methods have failed or are inappropriate. The choices of a treatment include systemic steroid, which may be useful in rapidly progressive and painful proptosis during the congestive phase, unless contraindicated, for example, patients having tuberculosis or peptic ulceration. Either we use oropridnisolone or IV methylprednisolone. The other choice is radiotherapy, which may be used in addition to steroid or when steroids are contraindicated or ineffective. Other choice is combined therapy with irradiation as a thioprene and low-dose prednisolone may be more effective than steroid or radiotherapy alone. Monoclonal antibody treatment with rituximab also shows very good results. The other choice for treatment of proptosis is the surgical decompression may be considered either as the primary treatment or when the non-invasive methods are ineffective such as for cosmetically unacceptable proptosis in the quiescentic phase. Decompression aims to increase the volume of the orbit by removing the bony walls and may be combined with the removal of orbital fat to increase the retroplacement of the glove. Resubstructive myopathy. About 30 to 50 of patients with thyroid eye disease develop ophthalmoplegia 
and this may be permanent. Ocular motility is restricted initially by the inflammatory edema during the congestive phase and later by fibrosis in the cosentic phase. Intraocular pressure may increase in up gaze due to ocular compression by fibrotic inferior rectus. There is many ocular motility defect we may see elevation defect as a result of fibrotic contracture of inferior rectus, abduction defect due to fibrosis of medial rectus, depression defect due to fibrosis of superior rectus, abduction defect caused by fibrosis of the lateral rectus. We have two choices of treatment, either surgery or botulinum toxin injection. Surgery indication in diplo is when the surgery indication here, when the diplopia is in the primary and reading position of gaze, provided that the disease is equicentric and the angle of deviation has been stable for at least six months. Until these criteria are met, diplopia may be alleviated if possible with the presence. Goal is to achieve binocular single vision in the primary and reading position. The other choice, as I said, Botulinum toxin injection into the involved muscle may be useful in selected cases. Optic neuropathy is an uncommon but serious complication of thyroid ophthalmopathy caused by compression of the optic nerve or its blood supply at the orbital apex by the congested and enlarged recti. Such compression, which may occur in the absence of a significant proptosis, may lead to severe but preventable visual impairment. How we diagnose these patients? Usually the presentation is with impairment of central vision. In order to detect early involvement, patients should be advised to monitor their own visual function by alternatively occluding each eye, reading small prints, and assessing the intensity of colors, for example, on a television screen. The signs including Reduced visual equity, but not invariably. It is associated with a relative efferent pupillary defect due to optic nerve affection, color desaturation, and diminished light brightness appreciation. It is important not to attribute the disproportionate visual loss to minor corneal complication and miss optic neuropathy. Early We'll see the optic disc is normal on examination. Later on, due to congestion, there is a swelling of the optic disc. Later, after a period due to prolonged congestion and compression, there will be, there will be atrophic changes in optic nerve of atrophy. Treatment initially is usually with a systemic steroid. Orbital decompression may be considered if steroids are ineffective or inappropriate. These were the most important subject in the orbit. Uh,